The Mood administration's proposals for an end of war declaration here on the Korean Peninsula has been met with mixed reactions. And further complicating matters in recent days has been North Korea's test launching of its missiles. For more, I have Professor Min Jong Hun from the Korea National Diplomatic Academy. Welcome back, Professor Min. My pleasure. I also have Dr. John Park, Director of the Korea Project at Kennedy at Harvard Kennedy School, live on the line. Dr. Park, it's a pleasure to have you with us. Great to be here. Thank you. Right, Professor Min, we'll start here then. Let's begin with the overall international response to the Moon administration's efforts to formally end the Korean War. Well, the first of all, I want to say that um, in the United States, the Democratic members of Congress proposed a legislation titled the Peace on the Korean Peninsula Act and uh, the last uh, the May. And uh, the bill contains the, the end of war declaration peace agreement and the humanitarian aid and so on. And in Europe, you know, members of Congress in the United Kingdom and France have got re resolutions respectively and they support the uh, peace on the Korean Peninsula. And specifically several members of Congress in the uh, United Kingdom, uh, they proposed a resolution uh, to support for the peace on the Korean Peninsula Act that the U.S. Congress proposed, and the French legislators, uh, they adopted a resolution to endorse the end of war declaration. So I think it shows the international community or the many countries uh, support the end of war decla declaration and the peace on the Korean Peninsula as a whole. Right. Dr. Park, in early November, 23 U.S. House lawmakers penned a letter to U.S. President Joe Biden claiming that a formal end to the state of war on the Korean Peninsula would be an important step toward peace. Now, that letter was led by Democratic Representative Brad Sherman of California, who back in May introduced a bill that Professor Min mentioned that called for diplomatic engagement with North Korea for a binding peace agreement. Could you tell us a bit more about that particular bill? Absolutely. Congressman Sherman uh, very much led this effort. And if you look at the two key elements there, it was to amplify the work that had been done prior uh, in the inter-Korean relations dynamic, where we had the leader of North Korea and South Korea uh, come out with the Panmunjom Declaration. And so in recognition of that uh, landmark agreement, uh, you know, we see Congressman Sherman trying to get more momentum going on the U.S. side. The uh, pillar that I think is cru crucial is calling upon the Secretary of State to establish liaison offices between the United States and South in North Korea, and also uh, create a, a avenue for the uh, Korean American citizens and others, uh, U.S. nationals, to engage in humanitarian activities and humanitarian trips to North Korea as well. But uh, it's important to point out that symbolically this is important, but it's also something that is non-binding in terms of what uh, Congressman Sherman put forward. Right. Dr. Park, staying with you then, last December, 33 Republican lawmakers sent a letter to the Biden administration opposing an end of war declaration. Tell us a bit about this letter as well. Sure. What we're seeing is uh, very much the focus on the process and at what stage of the process you would see something like the end of war declaration. Uh, as you mentioned, this particular initiative views this as coming at the very end of a process where we see the completion of denuclearization, improvement of relations, essentially all of the obstacles removed, and then having the end of war declaration. And so while in principle you see the various groups support uh, something like the end of war declaration, there's quite a bit of divergence in terms of sequence, timing, and consequences overall with respect to the different type of conditions in place. Right. And back here in the country, Professor Min, what has been the progress and efforts to pass a resolution, that is, on ending the Korean War proposed by liberal lawmakers, that is, back in June 2020? Well, the, as you know, the Korean government and the Korean administration, like the, the Ministry of Unification or the Uni Ministry of Foreign Affairs, those the government, the, the departments are mainly in charge of uh, conducting diplomatic dialogue with the U U.S. and the North Korea including the end of war declaration. So the, I think what the members of the South Korean National Assembly mainly do in the diplomatic activities is to support the government work by making legislations or their own the congressional diplomacy. So if the resolution for the end of war declaration is passed in South Korea, it, can, it, it could support the, the government work in, institutionally. 
Uh, but uh, the resolution is still in the legis legislative, legislative process. Uh, and I think it's mainly because uh, the members of National, the, uh, the Kang National Assembly in South Korea, they have different opinions about the resolutions, the resolution the mainly in terms of their party affiliation. As you mentioned, the progressive, uh, the ruling party members, they support the end of the uh, end of the end of the war uh, declaration and the resolution, and they also want to make a progress in terms of the uh, the, uh, the peace process on the Korean Peninsula that the Moon Jae-in government has worked on. Meanwhile, the, uh, the conservative opposition party members, they are they are reluctant to the uh, supporting the, uh, the declaration and uh, they argued that uh, North Korea is not sincere and trustworthy in terms of denuclearizing de itself and uh, they are also the trustworthy and not trustworthy. North Korea is not the trustworthy in terms of the making progress in the inter-Korean relations. So there are some the, the political the, the situations, the political oppositions, and the po political differences uh, uh, between the, the two major parties in South Korea. So I think it will take more time before we can see the situation where the bill is passed in the, the National Assembly of South Korea. And against that background, Professor Bin, do you suppose greater support for the declaration from countries other than the U.S. would perhaps serve to add tangible momentum to related efforts? Yeah, absolutely. The, I think that the uh, international community's support for the declaration could provide the momentum uh, to resume the nuclear talks between U.S. and uh, North Korea. As you know, the failure to reach an agreement in the 2000. 19 Hanoi summit made a negative impact on Kim Jong-un's leadership in North Korea. And the North Korea argues that it took already some measures for the de and it's about the, uh, the time that the U.S. should do something for the, uh, the, uh, uh, the de process. And the North Korea also argues that it could return to the negotiation only when U.S. takes back the, its uh, the hostile policy on North Korea. So I think that it's necessary for North Korea to have something that it can take advantage of in order to save Kim Jong-un's face and to get back to the negotiating table. So if many countries in the world or the international community, community support the uh, declaration, then um, North Korea could have a better situation to the, uh, respond to the declaration and uh, it can take advantage of the declaration to get back to the negoti negotiating table. Right, I see. Dr. Park, Seoul's top diplomat Chong Yong has claimed that South Korea and the U.S. have effectively agreed on a draft declaration for a formal end to the Korean War. Simply speaking, what are your thoughts? I think what we're seeing is an alignment uh, support in principle of the end of war declaration and the recognition that the importance of bringing peace to the Korean Peninsula is clearly a priority for all the parties concerned when it comes to these particular issues. However, as I mentioned earlier, the differences related to sequencing uh, and some elements there I think is a part of the policy debate here in Washington. The other element that I think is crucial is the differences in views uh, in terms of the end of war declaration serving either as a catalyst leading to a re-engagement in terms of a process, negotiations, and eventually the idea of a roadmap uh, or something that fizzles out. And I think that's the key component of the difference of opinion in Washington. Right. Professor Min, earlier on Tuesday, that is yesterday, now mm -hmm. North Korea test fired yet another missile into the East Sea, just as members of the United Nations Security Council met over in New York to discuss Pyongyang's earlier test launch last week. What do you believe are Pyongyang's intentions? Well, the, basically, I don't think that uh, there is uh, the, any correlation between the, the uh, test of firing of the missiles and the UN Security Council meeting. Um, as you mentioned, the North Korea launched the, 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 the missiles the second time, less than a week. And the North Korea said that um, it successfully conducted the test of firing of a hypersonic missile. And uh, interestingly, Kim Jong-un attended the firing. And the North Korean state media said that um, the test of fire was aimed at the final verification of overall technical the specifications of the developed the weapon system. So I think that North Korea developed or the up, 
updated their missiles and uh, they just needed to test them for the technical considerations or purpose. And the Kim Jong-un attended the firing. The, and they shows that um, successful launch of the missiles could be meaningful technical progress for North Korean missile system or the military capabilities. So I think the timing of the test of firing of the missiles has a little to do with the UN Security Council meeting. Instead, I think North Korea just followed what they were supposed to do in order to test the, the developed missile system. Right. And Dr. Park, the White House, for its part, has denounced the latest launch. What response strategy do you envision Washington adopting in the future with regard to Pyongyang? I think at this point it's quite limited. Uh, there was a meeting at the, the UN Security Council, as we heard from Professor Min, and what came out of that was a joint statement. Uh, but in terms of the actions that uh, the different parties, and particularly the United States, can take uh, in this current situation, other than uh, these uh, very carefully worded statements, are quite limited. There are two factors at play. One is when you look at the North Korean approach to dealing with COVID, the COVID prevention policies with border closures and reduction of trade far exceed anything that a sanctions uh, measure could achieve. And so any potential use of sanctions to address the testing cycle right now would be quite muted. And the second, as we see growing tensions between the United States and China, a critical element of dealing with North Korea in the past and trying to engage North Korea in the past has been cooperation and coordination between Beijing and Washington. That's off the table right now. And I, I think with this, we see a constrained uh, space in terms of where the U.S. can potentially respond. Uh, and clearly, the hope is that the North Koreans will maintain this level of testing and won't go to something like the intercontinental ballistic missile testing in 2017. Professor Min, staying with the response, not uh, right, Professor Min here. North Korea in recent days, Professor, has been not as vocal with regard to the Moon administration's efforts to ensure a formal end to the Korean War and to international condemnation of its recent shows of might, if you will. What are your thoughts on this? Well, the, basically, I think the ad Dr. Park mentioned, I think that uh, the COVID-19 situation make a significant impact on North Korea's recent uh, diplomatic activities. I think, I mean, the North Korea is silent uh, nowadays, mainly because of uh, its COVID-19 situations. Now, the, I think COVID-19 has made North Korea to close its borders, and the North Korea has focused on um, the controlling the spread of the virus <coughs> in its territory. The North Korea's poor uh, quarantine systems and the medical capabilities could not cope with the situation if the virus comes in across the borders. And as you know, North Korea recently announced that it would not participate in the upcoming Beijing Winter Olympics, and which means that no one will come out and no one come back to the country in terms of the sporting events. And uh, considering the close and important the relationship between North Korea and China, Pyongyang's decision not uh, to take uh, to participate in the Beijing Olympic should be a big deal. And uh, so I think the decision was made inevitably by Pyongyang and China had to understand and accept it. So I think the COVID-19 is the most important factor to explain the North Korea's the, uh, behaviors nowadays. And therefore, it will take some more time before North Korea uh, could respond to the uh, diplomatic and security matters more actively. Right. And Dr. Park, aside from tensions with China, what other challenges lie ahead perhaps in efforts to ensure permanent peace on the Korean Peninsula, do you think? The core element right now is what North Korea is unveiling. And this is really something that uh, was seen coming uh, down the pipeline here. North Korea had conducted tests last year, and we saw Kim Jong-un announce uh, at the end of December that he would be bolstering mil military and defense capabilities. And so the actions that we're seeing right now take place aligned with those statements, and it looks like there will be more of it. Uh, and so with the months ahead and uh, with respect to the Moon administration, a limited time period, there is a sense of urgency, clearly. Uh, and so I think the testing cycle right now, trying to view it in terms of something that isn't crossing certain thresholds, that North Korea is conducting type of testing capabilities that really aren't as uh, destabilizing as they may appear is going to be an important part of the messaging and the signaling in order to create that diplomatic space to re-engage and move forward on efforts related to the end of war declaration.
Right, and staying with such efforts, Professor Min, the heads of South Korea and China may meet mm -hmm. late this month. Do you believe this possible summit may perhaps advance the regional peace mechanism? Well, the, it is reported by the media nowadays that the ROK-China uh, virtual summit is likely to be held later this month or earlier next month, but uh, it's not official yet. But yeah, in, the, in the summit, and uh, I think that the two leaders are likely to talk about the peace process on the Korean Peninsula as a whole. And if uh, President Xi Jinping expresses his support for the declaration and China's active role in making progress uh, the, for the uh, Korean Peninsula peace process, then it would contribute to making a favorable environment for the end of war declaration. But as I mentioned earlier today, um, it will take us some more time before North Korea will respond to their declaration, mainly in terms of its COVID-19 situation. So I think it is necessary for South Korea to establish a favorable environment uh, for the declaration and also provide North Korea with uh, some more time and uh, also the humanitarian assistance to fully control the spread of the virus in its territory. It's like the humanitarian purpose. And uh, I believe that these efforts will contribute to maintaining the security situation of the Korean Peninsula stably and uh, moving forward the, for the peace process on the pon uh, Korean Peninsula. Right. Dr. Park, how do you respond to concerns that a peace declaration on the P Korean Peninsula would perhaps undermine the presence of U.S. troops in the region? We have seen uh, recent statements along those lines. And I, I think when it comes to the overall situation with uh, the efforts on the uh, end of a war declaration, looking at the context, I think that's the big cleavage here in terms of the different viewpoints. For those who adhere to the view that being too fast on the end of a uh, war declaration could have unintended consequences uh, that have implications for uh, U.S. positioning of troops on the Korean Peninsula, there is a lot of concern. Uh, others who are seeing this as a catalyst of a process that may actually improve the situation of longer term stability uh, lay out very you know, compelling arguments on that side as well. But the main one right now is what kind of process is in place. There is an effort to try to add more transparency, more predictability, and also a sense that there is linkage between these various uh, movements. The concern is that if the end of war declaration is one move, it could trigger these unintended consequences that don't fit into the overall game plan. So I think we're going to see more discussion along these lines, but the uh, viewpoints on what role the end of war declaration plays is really going to be dependent on what the overall process picture looks like from the various viewpoints here. Staying with you, Dr. Park, what are your thoughts on Pandit's opinion that the Biden administration is opting for a strategic patient approach with regard to North Korea? We saw very recently Jake Sullivan, the National Security Advisor, mention at a conference that the Biden administration had been and is continuing to try to reach out to the North Korean side, but they haven't heard anything back. And I think from that perspective, the Biden administration views more of the domestic turmoil inside of North Korea related to the economic situation as one of the main reasons why we're not seeing reciprocity on some of these efforts and overtures from the Biden administration side. So I think the uh, views of a strategic patience type of approach uh, that clearly is not the viewpoint from the Biden administration because of these efforts. Uh, if anything, uh, from this perspective, it's really what's happening inside of North Korea, the hope that the situation improves domestically and the conditions are conducive for this type of re-engagement and the beginning of some sort of negotiations. Right. Professor Min, what are your thoughts on Korea's strategy with regard to North Korea, South Korea's strategy, that is, with regard to North Korea after the presidential election slated for March 9th here in the country? Well, it's too early to say anything about the, uh, the South Korea's upcoming the, uh, the policy or the posture on North Korea because the, the, we, we can see that uh, very different policy the orientations uh, in terms of which party would win the, uh, the upcoming election. So I th uh, specifically, I, th I think that if the Progressive Party wins the election, then we can see the, some kind of continuation uh, of the current administration, North Korea policy, and the, 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 the next administration will also continue to have the, uh, the engagement policy 
uh, to talk with North Korea without any kind of preconditions. But uh, if the Conservative Party wins the election, we can see a little bit the different the methodology to deal with North Korea. So specifically, I expect that the, the, the next Korean the government will focus on the, uh, the denuclearization of North Korea first. Then they will talk about the, uh, the uh, just kind of the, uh, the helping North Korea uh, uh, like economically and also the talk about humanitarian aid and something like that. So we'll see the, which party will the, take the, uh, the power in the, uh, the march and then we'll and then we'll talk about the uh, the policy orientations of South Korean government on North Korea. Right, of course. And keeping in mind Professor Min's words, Dr. Park, do you envision perhaps a more active effort from the part of the Biden administration with regard to affairs here in the region after the presidential election in March? There's going to be a, a consistency uh, with respect to the Biden administration approach to dealing with the situation here because it fits into the larger Indo-Pacific strategy. And they're the primary focus uh, looking at the growing competition, something that is seen as a structural element now. Uh, and so for the U.S. to have that geopolitical, geoeconomic approach to try to deal with uh, China introduces this element of consistency there. And the efforts to work with the core allies, South Korea and Japan, as a part of that. So I do see an element of uh, continuity there, irrespective of the outcome of the presidential election in South Korea in March. I see. All right, Dr. Park, thank you very much for making the time to join us live at this very late hour at your end with your thoughts. And Professor Min here in the studio, thank you very much for your insights. Thank you.